Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you're excited to be here. I know I'm excited. I always, always get a little nervous right before I come up here just because, well, I just get nervous because it's God's Word, and I want to make sure that, that you hear it and don't want to be rude or anything, but I believe God has given me a message. I believe he gives Herwick a message every week, and so if you could turn off your alarm clock that's set for 12 o'clock, turn off your phones. I don't want you to, I don't want your beeping to interrupt somebody's calling at the end of this invita- at the end of the invitation, um, so giving you the chance there. Um, so let me open us in prayer now, and, and then we can begin. God, we praise you. We do thank you. I thank you for this opportunity, as it possibly could be one of my last opportunities to give your word. Lord, I pray that, that in this kind of setting, I pray that I continue to fervently give your word wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, as, as each of us should be doing, Lord. I pray that, that uh, my life will be a testimony and encouragement to those around me, even though I'm not going to be a, a pastor at a church, God. I pray that that continues long after today and, and long after this summer. And so, Lord, I pray that you move today mightily in this message. Speak through me and use me to speak to these people, God. I pray that they hear you. I pray that they respond to you. And I pray that you are glorified through that. And it's in your holy name we pray, amen. So last year, we, I signed up for camp. I had a, we went to the Ken Freeman's Wild Week camp and I had 22 people signed up for camp. And we paid for that, majority of which needed full-blown scholarships. So we paid that. And literally the day before camp, all but three of those students backed out. And I was mad. I think I'm a little bit bitter still, but I was, I was mad. I almost wanted to say, we're not going. I, I can't handle a full week. These people backed out on me. They, they backed out on their commitment. And so today, we're going to talk about commitment, not to each other. We will talk about commitments that we make, but specifically and, and more intentionally, our commitments to God. Um, I saw, we put the, the title was FOMO, and I wish I would have kind of lengthened it and said FOMO no mo. And uh, what that means is fear of missing out. And so today we're going to talk about um, being kind of trapped in that fear of missing out. We're going to be talk of, talking about what it means to, to not be committed and what it means to be committed. And so today, that's what we're going to do. And I've seen it in youth. I've seen it here in youth. And, you know, we are what, what our parents are. And so I know that if our youth are not committed neither are our parents. And so I think that's why it's important that we speak about this and, and challenge you, not in a sense of shame on you, but as a, I want you as members of the church, members of Christ's body, I want you to be good representatives of that. And so using that example from last year, using the example um, that I've seen and, and even my own life, uh, that's what we're gonna talk about today. And, and where we're gonna look at is first, uh, we're going to look in Hebrews 11, verse 32, and, and I believe that's on the screen. And really, this is the hall of faith. And so the author of Hebrews is telling the listeners, telling his audience, hey, remember throughout the Old Testament, these were the big names. These were the highlight people of the Old Testament. And he goes on throughout the whole Abraham, he gets to Moses, and then he says, what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Okay, I've heard of Gideon. Barak, okay, I think the donkey talked to him, and, and then we see Samson, no, it was Balaam, the Barak was uh, one of the generals in the army, and we talked to Samson, and, and we know who Samson is, and then we get to Jephthah, and I don't know who that is, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, and so then we go, and we're like, who's Jephthah? So does anybody know who Jephthah is? A few people? One or two? That's all right. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to go flip to Judges, and y'all can turn to Judges 11. And while y'all turn there, I'm going to read from Judges chapter 2, verse 18. And so before I do that, I want to just kind of set the stage. Moses led the people through the wilderness for 40 years. They disobeyed God, and that's why they had to stay for 40 years. A trip that should have only taken them a few weeks to maybe a year max took them 40 years because of their disobedience. And so... Here, Moses gets them to the promised land. Joshua leads them into the promised land, defeats many of their enemies, 
but they don't defeat them all. And so we look at in Judges 2, verse 18, it says, whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, and these judges were their leaders, it says, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of that judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groanings because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. So the whole book of Judges is basically the roller coaster ride of the Israelite nation. They follow God, everything is great, and then they decide, oh, we can, we're okay, we can do things on our own, and they get oppressed, they get defeated, they get beat by their enemies. And so it's this up and down, up and down, up and down, and that goes all the way to Judges 11, which is where we're gonna be at today. And so in Judges 11, we have Jephthah. And right before that, actually, the last verse, verse 10 of chapter 10, they were being oppressed by the Ammonites. The Ammonites was one of the nations that did not get defeated, that did not get completely taken out of the promised land. And so because of that, they were getting attacked. They were getting oppressed by the Ammonites. And the leaders of the Israelites, they said, Okay, if we can get anybody, if anybody will be our leader, if anybody will fight against the Ammonites, we'll make them our leader. Which doesn't sound so bad. If you want, you want somebody that you can follow that can defeat the enemy, that sounds like a pretty good leader to me. The thing is, in Judges chapter 2, it said that God raised up the leaders. The people didn't pick the leaders, God picked the leaders. And so here we get into Judges chapter 11. And I'll just kind of summarize these first few verses. But basically, Jephthah was born of a prostitute. So his dad, married to another lady, had several kids, decided that wasn't enough. So he went to a prostitute and had Jephthah. And nobody liked that. In fact, the brothers were like, you're not even part of our family, get out. And they kicked him out, kicked him to the streets, left him on his own. And he grew up hardened by his family, hardened by probably the life struggles that he dealt with. And he would be what I would today clarify as a gang member in fact he not only a gang member he was the leader of the gang and and it says that he was with worthless fellows is what it describes and so most of the time whoever you're associated with is probably who you are as well and so if he's with worthless fellows he is probably also a worthless fellow and so Jephthah kind of goes around and he's leading this group of men these gang members and he's kind of living off the land, taking from people, stealing from these people, going off here. He can't go into Israel, at all, or Israel all that much because, or Gilead, because that's where he got kicked out of. His brother's gonna chase him off. And so he's probably in the mixture of running from outer towns to the enemy's towns. And so he's probably intermixed with the enemy, the Ammonites. And so he's built up this kind of reputation. All right, don't mess with don't mess with Jephthah. He, dude, he's a bad dude. We don't want to touch him. We don't want to mess. Just leave him alone. Let him do his own thing, and he won't bother us. And so the Ammonites begin to oppress the Israelites more. They begin to, to make things harder for them, more difficult for them. And finally, it says that his brothers said, hey, let's get Jephthah. Jephthah, Jephthah can take care of this. He will, he will take care of the Ammonites. Let's get Jephthah to take care of everything. And so they go to Jephthah, and Jephthah says, you kicked me out, why do you want me now? What, what good am I to you now if all of a sudden, oh, we can't do this, we need Jephthah. And so they say, okay, if you, we made this promise, we made this promise before, if you will defeat the Ammonites, you can be our leader. We will, you will lead us, we will follow you. Whatever you say, we will do. So Jephthah's like, okay. I can do I can do that. I can we'll do this. Let's I don't mind being your boss. I don't mind telling you what to do. I don't mind you following after me. And so he does that. He he goes before them. He becomes their leader. And then he goes to the leader of the Ammonites and he says, Hey, king of the Ammonites, why are you attacking our land? And the king says, That's not your land, that's our land. See, before before y'all came into town, we had it, and then the Amorites took it from us and and now y'all took it from the Amorites, so really it's our land. And Jephthah, again the gang member, I think growing up on the outskirts of Israel, knew enough Israelite history to kind of cover the bases. You know, a lot of us, I know enough to get by and that's all that I need. And so Jephthah's like, no dude, God defeated that land. God, God took it over and he gave it to us. That's not, 
that's not our land, that's not your land, that's God's land, and he just happened to give it to us. You know, let your God give you your stuff, our God will give us ours. This is Israelite country, so stop messing with us. And the king of Amnon ignores him, just straight up stops following, just doesn't even talk to him, doesn't respond, doesn't say anything. And so this is what Jephthah does. Is it says in verse 29, and here's where we're gonna start today. It says that then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mitzpah of Gilead and from Mitzpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. And so as we read that, making a vow, making a promise, making almost a covenant to the Lord, and the thing is, during that day and age, a lot of the generals of armies would make vows to their gods. And so again, Jephthah being on the outskirts of Israel, he's picked up a lot of the traditions, a lot of the, I guess, religious aspects of other religions, other, other people groups around him. And so here he is copying what these other religions do, what these other people groups do. And so he makes a vow to God. He makes a promise to God. And so this is what his vow is. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, if you defeat them, if you let me defeat them, God, then whatever, and some of your translations might have a little asterisk, might have a little number next to it, can also be in the Hebrew turned to whoever. Which means if he meant whoever, then he realized it was probably gonna be a person that was gonna see him. He probably didn't know who it was gonna be, but he thought maybe somebody might come out of those doors. It says that when they came out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites, they shall be the Lord's. I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So here's what Jephthah said. God, if you give me victory, I will sacrifice whatever comes out of my house first. Whatever, whoever, it's yours. I'm gonna burn it in a sacrifice to you. I mean, I remember in high school, I would all be like, God, I didn't study for this, but if you give me an A, I will do so much for you, you will not even believe what I will do for you. And that's kind of what Jephthah is saying. God, if you give me this victory, I will burn whatever it is, I will kill whatever it is, it is yours. He's making a rash vow. Remember, the people chose, the people in a weak state, in their, in their state of rebellion, said, we'll pick whoever leads us, we'll pick whoever leads us, and we'll follow him, that'll be our leader. And then the person they picked out of their rebellion, in their rebellion, this is who they picked, he's also making a harsh, rash vow. And so Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites and to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. He was victorious. It says he struck them down from Aor to the neighborhood of Mineth, 20 cities, and as far as Abel Kiramim, with a great blow. So it wasn't just a, oh, he scraped by, he barely beat them. He wiped them out, he defeated the army. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. And then Jephthah came to his home at Mitzpah, and behold. And so here's where he's probably remembering, all right, whatever comes out of my house, sorry, but you're gone. And it says, behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And so all of a sudden, he comes walking in victorious, thinks, you know, maybe my animal is gonna come. Who has a, a dog, puppy, animal? You love your dog? And when I come home, Lindsay's excited to see me, but our dog is way more excited to see me than Lindsay is. We're not gonna say cats, because, hmm. Cats are cats. So the idea is when you come home, you see odds are Jephthah probably thought, hey, my goat's gonna come running out to me. My dog's gonna come running out to me. My little calf is gonna come running out to me and then I'll go sacrifice that and everything will be great because I promised the Lord I would sacrifice whatever, whoever came out. And out comes his daughter, his only daughter, and she's all excited because her dad's home. And so dads, think about your daughters. If you have a daughter, if you don't, then I guess you can't. But think about the daughter that you have or, or daughter-in-laws and think of them running out to see you and the thought that might go through your mind. I mean, I'm thinking Jephthah's thought was like, oh crud, 
Oh God, I did not promise for my daughter. I promised whatever, whoever. God, I did not meet my daughter. Oh my gosh. Hi, honey, why are you so excited? This is not a good thing. Oh my goodness. Oh, my daughter. That is my daughter. God, my only daughter. What was I thinking? What was I thinking when I made this? He says, alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot take back my vow. Look, first off, dad, that's not, I'm not the problem. You were the problem, not me. And so he makes this vow to the Lord and like he says, I cannot take it back. You see, in this culture, in this day and age, when you said something, you did it. You know, today we can say whatever we want, we can say whatever we need to say, and if we don't follow through, that's okay, it's not that big of a deal. I, I wanna go to camp, uh, but uh, I changed my mind, I don't wanna go to camp. Uh, maybe I want to do this, but mm, no. Uh, maybe I wanna help out, maybe I want to show up, maybe I, oh, I just don't feel like it today. Maybe I want to go to church tomorrow, but, ooh, 8.30 is kind of early on a Sunday morning, and I was having a great time yesterday, and I'm tired, and it happens to be raining, so I'm not going to show up tomorrow. That's how we work. That's how today's culture works. But this culture back then, whatever you said, that's what you did. And he says, I cannot take back my vow. And so as, in that mindset, I think, why? Why back out of it, dude? Get your, this is your opportunity. Take back. You didn't tell your daughter what you vowed. Take it back. Be, God, I meant to say my slave. I'll, I'll, my slave? I'll let what, whoever, whatever, anything but my daughter. And she says to him, looking at verse 36, my father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies and on the Ammonites, so think about this, this little daughter, this, his only daughter is going, whatever you said, dad, you've, you've already vowed it to the Lord. You've already told God you would do it, follow through with it. And he's like, yeah, but you don't know what I promised. So, so she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone for two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companion. So I and her friends, her and her friends are gonna go weep because she is still a virgin and says that they, so that he said, go. And he sent her away for two months and she departed, she and her companions, and went and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And it says at the end of the two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man and it became a custom in Israel. Okay, well. It's important to continue reading so you know what that custom is. That the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. And so the idea is, she was like, let me mourn this because this is a sad event. And many of you are going, well, yeah, that would be sad to die a virgin. And so here she's saying, let me go lament because what that means is she's his only daughter. Any chance of Jephthah having any kind of future to pass on, any kind of lineage to pass on would be through her, his only daughter. And so if she's gone, there's no hope for his future. There's no hope for what might become. And so she cries as, as in that culture it is also a big deal to, to not have children. And so as, as, she, as she weeps, as she laments, as she mourns, so is he. And he's realizing what I've done. And so like I said, today's culture, we say, why would he go through with it? Why, why not just back out? Dude, that's your only child. God will understand. God doesn't want you to kill your kids. God doesn't want you to, he don't want you to kill anything at the moment. I mean, we don't have to make sacrifices to him. Thank you for Jesus. But he doesn't. In fact, scripturally, he could have backed out. Leviticus 5, 4 through 6 basically says, if you make an oath, if you make a rash oath, if you make a vow that you can't keep or that you realize later is a sin, you have the right to back out of it. You can go and offer something different in its place. So he had the right to say, whoa, I didn't realize that was gonna be my daughter. You told us we cannot sacrifice humans, so I'm gonna back out of this, I'm gonna give you a calf. He had the opportunity to back out of his vow, but he didn't. And I think there's two reasons why he didn't. One, 
I don't think he knew that rule. I don't think he knew that law. See, the Israelites are trained to, to learn the word. They're trained to learn the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. But I think him being out on the outskirts, he didn't catch all of the storylines. I was a good kid and I didn't pay attention to every class. So I can only imagine that the gang leader probably didn't pay attention to any of the classes he was in either. And so here he is, probably doesn't know Leviticus 5, 4 through 6. But I bet you he knows Numbers 30, 1 through 2. And it says, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do this according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. See, Moses, right before he sent, right before everybody went into the promised land, he basically said, hey, here's what you've got to obey. When you go into this land, you have got to obey, you've got to obey this. If you make a vow to the Lord, you follow it. You don't change your mind. You don't back out. You don't say, eh, be hesitant. You follow through. And so today, we don't keep our commitments. We would be, and I would be, I would do anything. If I made that commitment, if I made that vow to God, I would do whatever it took to get out of that vow. And that's a serious vow, but not even serious vows today are we committed to. We've got, we've got a nursery team. We've got several teams that have committed to be nursery, nursery workers, and we have to find people to replace the no-shows on a weekly basis. We've got people that have committed and then back out of their commitments. We've got people that help with VBS. We've got people, and I'm just speaking from student and children's ministry because that's where I'm focused on. We've got people that have committed to things and back out of that. And that's, again, church members, not non-Christian. If you're non-Christian, we expect you to not be we expect you to live a sinful life. We expect you to back out because you're not a Christian. But if you're a Christian, we're held to a higher standard. We're held to be committed to God. And our reasons, we've, we've got good reasons. We've got good reasons to not be committed. We're too busy. We're overcommitted. I mean, I can think back to my life in high school. I had something every single night. I had Monday, church was Sunday. We had Monday, I had scouts. Tuesday, I had soccer. Wednesday, I had church. Thursday, I had soccer. Friday, I had football. Saturday, I had a soccer game. Sundays, I usually had some sort of soccer game. Um, but we made it an effort. We made it a point to go to church. And like I told the youth this morning, it's about our priorities. See, when we focus on these other things, we get overcommitted. We can't commit to the eternally significant things in our lives. You can show up once in a blue moon to church and think, that was a great message, but think about if you showed up every Sunday. Think about if you showed up every Wednesday. Think about if you read your word on a daily basis. I've told the youth before that when I do my quiet time and I'm reading and I get in the habit of not reading on a daily basis, when I skip a day or I skip two days or three days sometimes on, on the rare occasion or when I just feel bad, um, but I, re I get back and I go, okay, I gotta get back in God's word. And when I begin to read God's word, I think, man, that would have been perfect two days ago. Golly, you know what? If I would have read that two days ago, I could have handled that situation completely different. So when we back out of God's word, when we don't focus on the internal significant things in our lives, it miss, we miss out. We're not ready for what's to come. And this morning we talked about when Peter walked on water to God, he focused on the things around him instead of on Jesus. And when he focused on everything around him, he began to sink. And so when we focus on everything around us, we begin to sink. I like to think that I was a great soccer player. I, thought, I like to think I was a great kicker on the football team. And I thought, oh, one day, maybe, you know, I was in 10th grade, like maybe one day I can go pro. And I could kick the ball, 57 yard field goal in, a, in one of the football games. I could kick the ball down the field. And I thought, okay, we'll do this. And then I never grew. So that kind of defeated the point of me ever becoming a pro. But I could kick the ball and I didn't even go play college. And some of us today, we focus so much on the sports that we're in, the, the whatever it is that we're doing for our child, we wanna make sure they're the best at whatever it is. And I'm gonna be the bearer of bad news. Odds are you won't go pro. Statistically speaking, your child will not go pro. Okay, and if you beat the odds and you don't go pro and you at least go to college, odds are that'll be the end of it. And if your focus has been on sports, if your focus has been on whatever in your life and it hadn't been on God, then what good was all of it? 
there was no, I think Don told me this week, he goes, you know, of all the years he's lived, when he looks back, if he wasn't focused on God, it wasn't worth it. He, was, he, he can't see a life that fills him up, that gives him pure joy if it's not focused on God. And so we're too busy with worldly things. And sometimes it's the FOMO, the fear of missing out, or FOBO, which is fear of better offers. Yeah, got to throw those young hashtags out there for y'all. But FOBO, FOMO, fear of better offers, fear of missing out. I mean, I've heard specifically from students in the past, uh, well, I don't want to sign up for camp yet because I'm afraid something else might come up. Nothing's going to come up. I scheduled it so that nothing would interfere with camp. There was no other activity. There was no nothing during that camp. So you're not missing out on anything. Well, I'll just, we'll hold off. Next thing you know, they're not going to camp. And so that's students, adults. We do the same thing. We, well, I'm not going to commit to that because if I commit to that, then I'll kind of feel a little guilty if I back out of it. But I'm going to not commit. And Ecclesiastes says, if you can't keep a vow, don't make a vow. Now that's not to say, oh good, there's our skit. That's where we can end it here. We don't have to, if we don't make a vow, then we're okay, we're safe. No, as Christians, we should be making vows. We should be committing to things. And when we talked to, uh, I guess, the beginning of the year when we did the different uh, messages on what it means to be a church member, one of them was service. If you, see, if you see a need, fill a need. That's what the Christian motto should be. If you're a Christian and involved in a church, if you see a need, you should fill the need. Oh, Josh said there's, that we need more nursery workers? I can do that. I can sit there. I can hold the baby. Herwick, Herwick did it. Herwick held a baby. Well, granted, he has a baby, but he's still committed to being in there and, and serving in there. We've got people that literally see a need, fill a need. Some of you may or may not know, our ice machine was out for I don't even know how long it was out. And so Doug Settle came in and said, I can fix that. I'll see what I can do and I'll fix it. And he came in and he fixed it. They saw, I don't know if y'all have noticed, the rocks around the playground. I'm gonna use Doug Settle as a, I think that's a, he's a great illustration for this. He saw that the rocks were spilling over. He saw that the wood was all warped around the playground. So he used his gifts. He used his, his resources and he built the little metal thing to keep all the rocks in the playground. When he saw a need, he filled a need. And that's how we should be as Christians, as church members. We should see a need, fill a need. And so as we, we are not committed because we're afraid we might miss out on something better, we're not committed just because we're too busy, and then we're also not committed because it doesn't matter if we are committed. And like I said before, you, I can back out of that. It'll be, they'll understand, oh, something else more important came up, that'll be okay. I mean, think about it. Jephthah had every excuse to back out of his vow to God. He had every, every good excuse you could think of. Scripturally, he had the right. It was his daughter. So as a parent, he had every right to do with his daughter whatever he wanted. If he's gonna make that vow, he could back out of it. And yet he still didn't. He, he stayed through and committed to it. And so I want us to look at those are why we those are why we don't commit to things. Here's why we should commit to them. Why why commit as a Christian? If you're not again, it doesn't matter. But if you are a Christian, this is why you should commit. Because anything that anything great comes out of commitment. You don't go to the Super Bowl if you're not committed. You don't go to the NBA finals if you're not committed. You don't have a healthy marriage if you're not committed. And you don't have a relationship with God if you're not committed. And so here I, I took a segment of my vows to Lindsay that I said on, her, on, her, on our wedding day um, because to me, what better way to, to show you're committed than by getting married to somebody. And, and that's why we do vows is to commit ourselves to one another. And so I, I took part of it and here it is. While I was looking at her, I said, I pray and I vow that I will always love you. I didn't, I didn't edit this. I was perfect when I saw it. I was like, yes. I pray and I vow that I will always love you, protect you, provide for you. And as Christ died for the church in order to make it more holy, so will I sacrifice for you in order to make you more holy. 
I pray our marriage reflects that of Christ's union with the church. That's what I prayed to Lindsay. That's what I said to Lindsay on our wedding day. No, I am not perfect. Some days it is easier than others. Most days it is difficult. It is, it is a struggle. I make it a struggle um, because I forget that vow. I forget what I committed to her. I forget the promises I made. Matt Chandler, a pastor in, in the Dallas area, has said that Christian men should go to bed tired every night. If you're a Christian husband, you should be exhausted. When your head hits the pillow, you should fall asleep because you should be dying to your wife every day, just like Christ dies for the church every day. So as the men challenge accepted, this is what I, you should be dying to yourself for your wife every day. So we need to keep them because anything great comes out of commitment, an intense commitment. We need to keep them because that's, we should have a biblical worldview. We should look, through, look to the world through the lens of God, through the lens of scripture. And so when we look at different things, we should say, well, is that what God would want me to do? Is that, does God want me to back out of this commitment? Well, no, he says, if you make a vow, keep the vow. So I better stick with this. And then last thing for this is why should we keep commitments? We should keep them because who's gonna believe if you're flighty, flaky, or flippant with what you do, with what you say, who can believe you? You know, the boy that cried wolf, who can believe you if all you ever do is break your commitments, if all you ever do is break your vows? And so let your yes be yes. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, let your yes be yes. If you're gonna say yes, then do it. If you're gonna say no, then let it be done. If you can, you need to do it. If you see a need, fill a need as a church member. And so those are why we should keep our commitments. And last to talk about is, well, what commitment should we make? Josh, I don't wanna just say yes to everything. There was a movie about that. I'm not gonna say yes to everything. No, you don't have to say yes to everything, but there are a few things we should say yes to. We should first, Say yes to Jesus. If we don't commit to Jesus, if we don't commit to follow him as a Christian, I don't know if you can actually say you're a Christian. You know, there's the term lukewarm Christian, and I, I question if you are a lukewarm Christian, I question if you're actually a Christian. Question if you are a Christian. So to me, a lukewarm Christian is not a Christian. You see, if Jesus put in the effort that you put in, where would we be at today? That's the one that hit me home. When I was in, when I was in high school, the, one of the adult leaders said, if Jesus just showed up on Wednesdays and Sundays like you do, where would the church be today? I said, well, it probably wouldn't be here anymore. So we're, we should commit to Christ because he committed to us. We should commit to God's people. So first to Christ, then to God's people. When we commit to God's people, that means to the church, not the place. Church is not a place. Never in scripture was it referred to as the place. It was referred to as the people, the congregation. The, the people are the church. Again, it's not a place, it's your identity. And so specifically for us as Christians, this is our local church. This is where we are a part of the, the Christian body. It's Christ's body. This is where we are. And so that could be through our membership. And as we've talked about before, um, over the past, I guess, few months ago, it was what we can do as Christians, as members of this church, these are things we can be doing. We've got a welcome team. We've got a greeter team. We've got the, we've got the I don't even know what all the teams we have. We've got a nursery team, kids team. We got a youth team if you want to get involved. We've got our after the program, we've got a what's next team. And so if you have the gift, if you have the ability to, to lead others to Christ, if you have the ability and the knowledge to share the gospel with people, when people make decisions, we can send them to you. You can help us reach the masses. You can help us reach the lost people. So we should be committed to this church, showing up on Sunday, showing up on Wednesday. When we have events, we do our lunch in last Sunday. Be there, be a part of the body. We also need to be a part of a small group. And so we've got several small groups that mostly meet on Sunday morning for Sunday school, but we've got groups that meet throughout the week and, and Sunday nights that you can be a part of. 
Because if all you do is show up here, you don't really get to know everybody. You don't really get to go deeper than what you get out of this message today or next Sunday or whatnot. And, and Josh does it. To me, the past year has been your best. I'm, I've heard Josh for since I was a junior in high school. And to me, this, these past six months have been his best messages I've ever heard. Every week, it seems he's getting better and better. And I know that because of how much time he is preparing for these messages. See, what y'all don't see about Herwick is he's spending hours inside that office and he's got the little, we call it the Holy of Holies inside his office. And he spends hours praying, preparing to give you a message to bring you closer to God, to open your eyes so that God can speak to you, so that God can use you. And not everybody sees that. Not everybody sees the commitment that he has to this church. But I'm letting you know, he's more committed to this church than any person in this room. And it's because he loves God so much. So we should serve the church. We should be a part of community small groups. We should be a part of this church. And then last, when we've made commitments, we need to stick to them. Those are the four things. Commitment to Christ, commitment to church, commitment to serve the church, and then commitments that you've already made or are going to make. And you think, okay, Josh, but Jephtha, he made a vow to his, about his daughter and he stuck with that. I understand that. That's the Bible. It's supposed to give us examples. But those are the extreme examples. This is today. It's 2017, Josh. Well, here's the thing. We need to be committed because Christ was committed to us. Mark 14, 36, it's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible through you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So that was Jesus' chance to say, hey, God, I know you can do anything. I know if you want to say everybody is saved, they're saved. I know that you can do whatever you want, so please, please take this away from me. Please take this cup. Please take what I'm about to have to go through so that I don't have to do this. Please do that. That was Jesus' chance to back out of the commitment. That was Jesus' chance to give it to God, and that was God's chance to let him get away with it. Just like Jephthah's one and only daughter, one and only child, God sent Jesus, his one and only child, for us. Jephthah made a sacrifice for a rash vow. God made a sacrifice for his great love. And so when Jesus can commit to his will, when Jesus can commit to his love for us, we need to be willing to do the same thing. We need to be willing to say, not my will, but your will, God. Not in a get out of jail free card of, well, that's not what God wanted, so I guess I won't do it. But in a sense of God, truly, whatever you want in my life, let it be done. God, I can't stand kids, but if you want me to serve at VBS, I will serve at VBS. God, I do not want to go to Africa. I was, thankfully, I got out of it this year. Guess what? They might be going back next year. God, if I'm supposed to go to Africa and I don't want to, then I'll go. If you want me to go to Africa, I'll go. If you want me to go to anywhere else in the world, that's what I love to me is Micah's role is he is our missions travel agent. He's got connections with different people um, around the states with different organizations. If you want to go somewhere or if you feel God is calling you to go somewhere, even if you don't want to go, Micah can get you the hookup. And so maybe for you today, you need to say, God, I'm gonna commit that I'm gonna go somewhere for you. I commit that I'm going to serve here for you. I commit that I'm going to spend this week in your word. I'm going to commit to you. If God's putting that on your heart, then you need to do it. You don't need to back out and say, well, I just better not make it because I probably won't follow through with it. No, God's telling you, make the vow. God's telling you, come before me, promise me, and follow through with it. Because guess what? I promised and I followed through with my son. All I'm asking is for you to love me and serve me. And so as Jesus was willing to die for us, we need to be willing to live for him. And so again, today, as, as, as the 
band comes back up to, to play as we, as we finish this, I want you to focus on what God is moving in your hearts, what God is telling you to commit to. And so here we are, as I, as I begin to pray, as I begin to, to take this time, I want you to, to take the time to pray to yourselves. Maybe it's to have a conversation with someone. Maybe it's to have that conversation with the person that your friend who's, who's left. Maybe they've left this church. Maybe they've left another church. Maybe they've just got out of the habit of coming to church. And God's saying, I want you to talk to them. Maybe it's your friend at work. Maybe it's whoever, family member, and they don't know God. And, you're, and God's saying, I want you to commit to not only pray for that person, but to begin to speak to that person, to put it on your heart to go talk to them. And maybe for some of you, you're going, okay, I don't even know about any of this commitment stuff, but I think, I feel like I need to be doing something. And so maybe your commitment is to commit to God, commit to Jesus, believe that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, to get up on the cross, be nailed to the cross, bleed and die for us, and then be buried and raised from the dead. Maybe that's your commitment is to begin there. And what better place to begin than right there at Jesus' feet, right here today.